Tonight, the American ballerina detained in Russia as the U.S. prepares to punish Moscow over the death of Alexei Navalny. That ballerina, a woman from Los Angeles, led into a Russian court today. What she's accused of, it comes as the U.S. prepares major sanctions for Navalny's death and his mother's direct plea to Vladimir Putin. Also tonight, the landmark ruling, Alabama's Supreme Court legally recognizing frozen embryos as children. What does that mean for the unused embryos created for IVF and could it have a nationwide impact? The powerful storm slamming California, major flooding and landslides, boulders blocking the road, and some dramatic water rescues. The grim discovery in the search for an 11-year-old girl who never made it onto the school bus in Texas. Two new suspects and new murder charges in that deadly shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl parade. A suspect in a deadly double shooting at a Colorado university making his first court appearance as police reveal he was the roommate of one of the victims. Four days to the South Carolina GOP primary, Nikki Haley's defiant message as polls show her trailing Donald Trump nearly two to one. And from the diamond to the lanes, the baseball superstar who has mastered a different game with balls and strikes. There we go. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. We are learning for the first time that an American ballerina is being held under arrest in Russia, where she faces treason charges for donating to a Ukrainian charity. The 33-year-old Los Angeles resident who holds dual U.S.-Russia citizenship entered Russia in early January. U.S. authorities only recently learning of her arrest. This believed to be video of the woman during a court appearance taken by Russian security services. The news of her plight breaking right as the U.S. ramps up the pressure against Russia over the sudden death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Gabe Gutierrez now with late details. This is Xenia Karolina, a 33-year-old ballerina who lived in Los Angeles and is a Russian dual national. Tonight, authorities in Russia say they've detained her on suspicion of treason for allegedly donating money to support Ukraine. We are seeking consular assistance uh, that has not yet uh, been granted. Russia's Federal Security Service released this video apparently showing Karolina being led into a courtroom. She is not safe there and if we do not help her, so she will spend the rest of her life in jail. Karolina was initially arrested earlier this month in the same Russian town where American reporter Evan Gershkovich was captured. Today, a Russian court extended his pretrial detention for allegations of spying, which he strongly denies. It all comes as the White House prepares to announce new sanctions against Russia following the mysterious death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. We'll have a major package announced on Friday. The Biden administration is pushing for complete transparency as Russia's prison service says the 47-year-old Navalny died last week in a penal colony after losing consciousness following a walk. He was serving a sentence of more than 30 years on charges of extremism and fraud, which he denied. The day before, Navalny had looked healthy during this court proceeding. His wife and mother now demanding Russia return his body. Make no mistake, Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. A U.S. official now says President Biden will join a virtual meeting of G7 leaders on Saturday, the second anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Gabe joining us now. Gabe, I know you're tracking new information about the man accused of lying to the FBI about President Biden and his son. Yes, Lester. Federal prosecutors say Alexander Smirnov, the FBI informant now accused of lying about Biden family business dealings, met with Russian intelligence officials in November. Smirnov's lawyers say he's presumed innocent. And late tonight, a judge in Las Vegas just ordered him released on bond. Lester. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. Doctors and families seeking fertility treatments are weighing the potential impact of an Alabama ruling that found frozen embryos are children without exception, a ruling which could have broad implications. Laura Jarrett has more. Gabby Rodriguez, like so many others, is currently undergoing fertility treatment. We're this very traditional family that just wants to have a kid. But um, she's so now on edge ever. after the highest court in Alabama decided frozen embryos are children and people can be held legally responsible for destroying them. Rodriguez worries knowing doctors may find some of her embryos not viable. I 
don't necessarily want to implant a child that I know is going to miscarry. So what does that mean? My main worry is what are we going to do with the ones that are genetically abnormal and what does this mean if my clinic shuts down? Those questions tonight all because of Friday's ruling in a wrongful death case where the Alabama Supreme Court found parents could sue an IVF clinic after their frozen embryos were dropped and destroyed. The decision finding embryos on ice no different than unborn children in the womb could have potentially massive ramifications when frozen embryos are regularly created and discarded as part of fertility treatments. Ultimately, patients will be harmed by this decision. Dr. Mamie McLean, a fertility specialist in Alabama, says she's been fielding calls and emails over the court decision with no easy answers. We're concerned that with the new ruling, we may have to limit fertilization of eggs, which will limit success of treatment, limit efficiency, increase cost, and of course, risk to patients. While the decision is a first of its kind, other states like Florida now considering laws allowing parents to bring similar wrongful death claims. Others debating bills defining life to begin at the moment of fertilization. I never envisioned that anybody would question the morality of IVF, and now it's very scary. And Laura, what happens now? Is this the kind of decision that can be appealed? Lester, this could go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, but there's no guarantee that the justices would actually agree to take it up, in which case this decision in Alabama stands across the entire state there, Lester. Okay, Laura Jarrett, thank you. Yeah. In Southern California, tens of millions of people remain under the threat of flooding and landslides as the region gets hit with even more rain. Liz Kreutz is there. Up and down California's coast, a trail of destruction as another storm tears across the state. Massive boulders falling on the famous Pacific Coast Highway, blocking traffic. Fast rising waters, trapping drivers, leading to dramatic rescues. Los Angeles has seen nearly as much rain this month than it typically does all year, more than Seattle, New Orleans, and Miami. The deluge and storm after storm hitting California, taking a toll on the region's infrastructure and some of the areas already eroding coastlines. This neighborhood in the coastal city of Rancho Palos Verdes is in an active landslide area. Officials say for years it only moved inches a year, but now it started moving feet. It started with a crack and then it started to sink. And now all this sinking has just been got, gotten worse and worse. Water mains here continue to break. The city is asking for help. I feel very sorry for this part of our neighborhood. Nearby, the historic Wayfair's Chapel now closing indefinitely due to the shifting land. More than 175 weddings here canceled. Our structures are heaving, uh, foundations are cracking. Literally everything on our property is being affected by the ground that is moving. From falling trees to thousands of potholes to the multi-million dollar cliffside home still teetering on the edge. Tonight, much of California feeling the brunt of Mother Nature's force and this relentless winter weather. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles. Just breaking tonight, the body of that 11-year-old Texas girl who disappeared on her way to school last week has been found and a suspect is in custody. Erin McLaughlin joins me. What more do we know about this, Erin? Well, Lester, tonight officials announcing they found the body of 11-year-old Audrey Cunningham. Last Thursday, Audrey left her home in Polk County, Texas at around 7 in the morning. She was supposed to catch the school bus but has been missing ever since. Tonight, authorities also announcing they have a suspect in custody, 42-year-old Don Stephen McDougall. He will be charged with capital murder in connection with her death. Officials say he lives in a trailer behind Audrey's home and was considered a family friend. The sheriff alleges McDougall provided information that helped them lead her to the body in a river underneath a highway. The cause of death has yet to be determined. Lester. Horrible tragedy, Aaron. Thank you. In Kansas City, authorities today announced the arrest of two men charged with murder in the shooting that broke out at the Chiefs Super Bowl celebration last week. They said the gunfire erupted during a dispute between the men killing a bystander and injuring 22 others, many of them children. Now to the race for 2024. We're counting down to this weekend's GOP primary in South Carolina. Donald Trump versus Nikki Haley. And despite her poll numbers, Haley says she is not giving up. Here's Garrett Hake. Tonight, Nikki Haley says she's digging in for a long campaign to come with her pivotal home state primary just four days away. South Carolina will vote on Saturday. 
But on Sunday, I'll still be running for president. I'm not going anywhere. The former South Carolina governor and Trump administration U.N. ambassador vowing to stay in the race despite losing the first three early primary states and facing daunting Palmetto State polls that show her getting walloped by GOP frontrunner Donald Trump by a nearly two to one margin. Haley arguing former President Trump is the only Republican whom President Biden can defeat and that the country desperately needs new leadership. Trump and Biden are two old men who are only getting older. Growing emotional, speaking about her husband Michael, a National Guard officer deployed in Africa and a recent target of Trump mockery. I wish Michael was here today and I wish our children and I could see him tonight, but we can't. The Trump campaign releasing a new ad today attacking Haley over her tax policies as governor. Let's increase the gas tax by 10 cents over the next three years. Even as top Trump campaign officials argued to reporters in a memo that Haley has no mathematical path to the nomination and should be ignored as irrelevant and not newsworthy. Haley's political math problems only get worse after South Carolina votes on Saturday. 19 states will hold their nominating contests in the next two weeks. There are no public polls that show Haley leading Trump in any of them. Lester? Garrett Haig, thank you. At the United Nations today, the U.S. rejecting a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. And it comes as the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is worsening, with nearly 200 babies born into war each day. Molly Hunter is in Jerusalem. Those against? Tonight, the U.S. once again standing by Israel, vetoing a widely supported U.N. Security Council resolution, which calls for an immediate ceasefire. Proceeding with a vote today was wishful and irresponsible. Instead, proposing a rival draft, which calls for a temporary ceasefire as part of hostage negotiations. But the diplomatic wrangling has failed to stop the war for Gaza's most vulnerable. The U.N. estimates there are 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza, with nearly 180 babies born every day. Our team meets 30-year-old Sama Hajjaj in Rafa. She's eight months pregnant with no prenatal care, no vitamins, no fruits and vegetables, she says, no clean water. She's worried her baby is already seriously harmed. I'm worried, she says, I will give birth right here in a tent. It's no place for a baby. But nearby, Miriam Ahlul rocks 15-day-old Razan. Miriam walked out of the hospital just two hours after birth. I hoped I would die, she says. They've killed our motherhood. In the occupied West Bank, we speak with Dr. Najib Salama, who says the biggest risk is where labor starts. And with extreme shortages of antibiotics and pain medications, infections are almost inevitable. How dangerous, in your assessment, is it to be pregnant in Gaza today? You're going always to be concerned about your pregnancy, mm -hmm. to provide yourself and your baby with the best medical service. Back at the Emirati Maternity Hospital in Rafa, it doesn't stop. Four babies to an incubator, and these are the lucky ones. Molly Hunter, NBC News, Jerusalem. In 60 seconds, new details about that deadly college shooting in Colorado Springs. The suspect appearing before a judge as we talk with the roommate of one of the victims. What we're learning next. Tonight, new details of the deadly shooting inside a dorm room at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Police revealing the suspect was a student and a roommate of one of the two victims. Emily Aketa has the latest. The accused gunman in a college campus shooting, making his first Mr. court Jordan. appearance virtually today. Sir, what is your name for the record? Mr. Jordan. 25-year-old Nicholas Jordan is facing two counts of first-degree murder after he allegedly shot and killed two young people last week at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, where he was a student. UCC has Alpine Village for gunshot victims. Police revealing the shooting happened in a dorm room the suspect shared with one of the victims, 24-year-old Samuel Knopp. 26-year-old Celie Montgomery, who did not attend UCCS, was also killed. The community walking in the victim's honor Monday, just hours after officers tracked down and arrested Jordan several miles from campus with a gun, prosecutors say, in the car. 
he was carrying on his day as it was a normal day, and I think that was a benefit to us. Investigators say they believe this was a targeted attack, but have not said what they think motivated the devastating shooting. When I found out, I like collapsed to the ground. And Senior Hayden Gillespie lived with Sam Knopp last year, describing the loss of his dear friend, seen here playing guitar, as unimaginable. Me and Sam are going to graduate together this semester, so it's just tough to, to go through it without him. And the defendant's bomb was set at $5 million today after prosecutors argued the Michigan native could be a flight risk and tried fleeing following the shooting. Lester? Emily, thank you. Coming up, more teens are turning to popular weight loss drugs, but are they safe for young patients? Up next. There are some of the most in-demand medications on the market, drugs that help you lose weight, but are they safe for treating obesity in children? Vicki Wynn now with what parents need to know. We got two second places and a first place. 16 year old Demi Buckley um, never thought about her weight until sixth grade. I gained 20 pounds that summer. She says the extra pounds started to affect her mental health. There was this boy in my class and he told me to eat a salad or eat nothing. It's brand new. I have a year ago, she started Wagovi. And, then, and I'll just put it right in my stomach right there. The drug and suppresses appetite. That, um, Buckley shed 58 pounds. What were some of the things that you did before these medicines to try and lose weight? I've done volleyball, cheer, um, basketball, and marching band. I would do the same workouts as my friends or eat the same way they did. And what parent doesn't want their child to have every opportunity to be as healthy as they can be? More than 20% of 12 to 19 year olds are considered obese. Obesity specialists say these meds, along with a healthy lifestyle, can be used preventatively to tackle excess weight before it leads to other health conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure, which is why the American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends weight loss drugs be offered to those as young as 12. Dr. Amanda Velasquez is the director of obesity medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center and a paid consultant for weight loss drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly. What do you say to people who say 12 is too young to put a child on a weight loss medication? Yeah, I think that it's about education for the family because I think there's a lot of perception about using the medication about a, for really appearances. That's not what we're here to do. What we're here to do is help to your patient, a 12 year old, be healthy. But there are possible side effects like nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. Doctors at UC Irvine say they're worried these drugs could affect kids growth from under eating or be abused by those with eating disorders or in sports. Some also question whether kids need to use these drugs long term. What do you say to people who think the data is not there, that we don't know the long term effects for young people? Yeah, so we, these medications, I think, are reassuring in that they've been around, you know, over a, over a decade. In a statement, Wagovi's maker Novo Nordisk says its studies found their medicines did not appear to affect growth, adding the decision to prescribe an anti-obesity medication is at the discretion of the physician. Demi Buckley says she has benefited physically and mentally. Now that I'm confident in my, my body and like I can be confident in my mind and that helps me a lot. Vicki Wynn, NBC News, Saginaw, Michigan. And up next, he's a major league star striking it big in batting and bowling. Finally, he's a baseball superstar, but this slugger spends his spare time in a very different lane. Here's Morgan Chester. It's belted to left center field. Home run! Mookie Betts is in a league all his own. With a swing, that's pure baseball. Gone! And swagger in another sport entirely, where three strikes is celebrated. Bowling's in my blood. You really did pick up a bowling ball before baseball. Yeah, way before. That's right. The L.A. Dodger seven-time All-Star and two-time World Series champ says some of that baseball success started in a bowling alley. Bowling is so complex. It's like you have to be creative. A lot of visualization when it comes to bowling, just like baseball. He credits the sport with keeping a competitive edge, even wowing fans at the World Series of bowling. 300 game rolling so many perfect games since how often are you calling saying hey babe leave the bowling alley <laughs> he and his wife brianna now using both sports to give back creating the 50 50 foundation to help inner city children i get to do 
two things I love, bowl and raise money to help others. And as we you can know, attest, that isn't are. just yep. a talented bowler. Fingers in and you just spin it. He may have a Hall of Fame future just... in coaching too. Here we go. <laughs> Don't think, just do <laughs> For now, the MLB All-Stars focus is back to spring training. But rest assured, Vets Eye is always on the ball. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. He's on a roll. That's nightly news for this Tuesday. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.